Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. This is where it's at, ladies and gentlemen. Approaching 100 episodes. This has been really fun. This is sponsored by Courtroom Sciences. Go to www.courtroomsciences.com. Brand new website. It's badass, actually. Um, articles, blogs, podcasts, all types of information for you and all of your litigation support needs. Today uh, is, a, is a guest who has a very unique position. I've been looking forward to this podcast for some time. Uh, his name is Charlie Price. He is one of my good friends from the International Association of Defense Council, I, IADC. IADC, I've been speaking at IDAC, I mean, for a long, long time. My good friend, uh, Andrew Chamberlain, I believe is the president now. And they have such a great group of defense counsel. And I will be speaking to them very shortly with uh, co-member John Nunnally uh, on nuclear verdicts. Looking forward to that. Um, welcome to the show, Charlie Price. Uh, Charlie has been, he was in practice for uh, about 20 years at a law firm in Northeast Ohio. In 2016, Charlie joined Eaton's litigation team uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, where he currently manage, helps manage litigation around the world. He is a teacher at the law school at the University of Akron, and he teaches a course called Winning Before Trial. We're going to talk a lot about that. Charlie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, Bill. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm excited to do this. I Listen, so you, you, you reside in Cleveland now? Correct. Okay, so I guess the first real question is, I mean, is Baker Mayfield coming back? Is he done? I know he tore up the shoulder because I think your season pretty much depends on it. I would I would tend to agree. I'm, I saw a news report at about noon today that he was going to be playing uh, in the Steelers game. So, uh, yeah, I hope he's, his shoulder and his arm stays on for the rest of the season, but he's going. Well, if you have to beat one team, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers if you live in Cleveland. We all know what that's about. And you got to watch out for Pittsburgh. They're kind of sneaky. You think they're bad, and then they come out and you know they beat the Bills in the opener. It's you never know what's going on there. But uh Cleveland is a a, a great sports town. And, and my father uh is a lifelong uh Cleveland Browns fan. So I had to grow up going through things like the fumble. Yeah, I mean, you know, all those things. Very traumatic time. Uh, the drive, the drive the year after, right? Very traumatic time in my life. I didn't want to bring that up, but I'm very fond of Cleveland, very fond uh, of the Browns. And um, you, I think you're the first person that we've had on the podcast that's not only an attorney and, and you're in-house, but you, 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 teach, you teach a law school. And when I do speaking across the country, it's funny because a lot of, I get a lot of questions from the audience uh, and, and many of them, believe it or not, are like, why don't they teach this stuff in law school? talking about like my reptile theory talks or my nuclear verdict talks and my response and maybe i'm wrong but uh, like your opinion my response is i don't think they're ready for this talk in law school what what's what, what what's the story on law school these days and how are things over at the university of akron well i think uh you know so we have you know right here we have cleveland state which is a great law school akron which is a law school a great law school and you know Things are good. Akron is, you know, a few years ago, they had a, a really a great dean, a forward, a real forward thinking dean named Matt Wilson, who's now at Temple University, Japan. And he, you know, he was um, he, he, he was the dean and then he became the president of the college and he was pushing everything, anything that was innovative, anything that was um, going to be the next thing he was open to. And that's and so I approached him about a, a class that I was really interested in a, a topic um, and asked if he was interested in it. And he said, yeah, go develop it and let's do it um, without, I mean, it was in the same conversation. He just listened to it and said, let's do it. And that's, um, you know, Akron is a great place for that kind of thinking. And, and it's been awesome being there. Before we talk about this course, you just, I just thought of a new question here based on what you just said. I'm not a lawyer. I didn't go to law school. Uh, I did. I think I, I took the LSAT once at some point and did so badly on it. Uh, it turned me into a, a <laughs> clinical psychologist. Um, so that, that really defined uh, my career pathway there. It, are, 
are law schools the same? Like, is, I mean, are they, I guess, or another question is, uh, based on what you're seeing now, what you know of other schools, I mean, you hear about all these law schools and then you have some of the, you know, more medium-sized schools, small schools. Are they all kind of teaching the same stuff or, or is there, is there a lot of big time differences between law schools today? Yeah, I think there is. A, I think there's a difference in, in philosophy and focus. And I went to Case Western, another school right here in Cleveland yep. uh, in, in the backyard. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, Case was focused on sort of just thinking, legal thinking, becoming great thinkers. Uh, Cleveland State, for instance, it was more focused on very practical aspects. How do you, how do you, what do you need to be a, a, a good lawyer? And, um, you know, I think there's a rivalry between those two schools who are right in Cleveland, but, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our great public servants, a lot of our great judges come from Cleveland State. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a, it, it draws a different student, students. It, it has, uh, it's maybe a little bit, at least when I was going to school, a little bit easier to get into that school, but a focus on uh, a whole, in completely different area where, you know, Case was a very traditional law school education, uh, Socratic method and all that stuff. So I do think that there are differences in where you go. Some schools just focus on trying to get you to pass the bar exam. Wow. Um, you know, so e each one is different. I think that uh, there's probably value in all of the different theories, but they are different. Excellent. Well, let, let's talk about the course that you teach, uh, Winning Before Trial. How, lo how long have you been teaching that course? And what really, what was the spark that, that generated this course? Uh, yeah, I've been teaching it since 20, well, I guess 2015, we started developing it. 2016, it was launched. Um, and uh, I think I had like five students. Now, now we oh. have a waiting list. On, we'll have a waiting list this year. Oh, wow. It's um, awesome. And, uh, but, you know, I would say that I was a very average, I was a very average student, maybe even below average student. I got into the practice of law and I realized, like I looked around and I saw like, you know, all these really smart people who all knew the law, who all worked their asses off. And that's what I was doing. And I looked around really quickly and said, well, if I'm going to do anything here, I better figure out what, what the advantages are, because if I'm just going to get by on you know, on, on my regular lawyer stuff, you know, I'm not a, I don't have some, you know, some great oratory voice, you know, and so I might ever get an advantage. So I started looking at, okay, what are the ways that, what are the things I can get good at? And a lot of them were outside of the field of law, psychology, which is what gets me uh, excited about, you know, talking to you. And the first time that I've listened to your podcast, you know, I was hooked because, you're talking about you. stuff that I think every lawyer should should be able to do. And so anyway, as I, uh, I tried to figure out ways I was going to stand out, a lot of it took me away from traditional lawyer stuff and into other areas. And, uh, you know, after, um, you know, doing it for a long time on my own, I spoke with Dean Wilson about, hey, would this be an interesting class? And he said, yeah. And, and you know, and, and so kind of that was the impetus was, okay, there's all these lawyers that are out there, uh, you know, 1.3 million lawyers. We're all trained this basically the same way. We all have access to the same materials. We're all driven. We all are workaholics. We obsess. And so how do you stand out amongst that group? And, um, and, and you know, how do you do it well? And, I, and, and the answer I thought was, well, you have to leave law and you have to, you have to go into understand key aspects of psychology and economics and statistics and accounting and neuroscience, all these other things, just big ideas that you can take and apply. And that's, that's what this class is. What, uh, so at what point in law, uh, law, law school's three years, right? Yeah. At, at what point are students ready for such a discussion? So this is a second or third year class. So I think you, if you have, um, you know, if you've had some intro classes about discovery and about civil procedure and maybe evidence and maybe trial advocacy, then you're, you're ready. But a lot of the science can be applied, you know, really to anything. So, but we, the class is a second year, third year class. Excellent. Do you ever have guest lectures come in to talk about some of these uh, specialized topics that are maybe outside of law? 
we have a lot of guests that, that you know, one of the ways we dealt with COVID was every, uh, every class we had a different person from around the country call in. Um, I think we've had one non-lawyer, one or two non-lawyers speak, um, but that's one thing that um, we're going to keep even when we're back in the classroom is these call-in guests. And uh, so like someone like you with your background, yeah. you could, you could in, in an hour, you could, you could give them such an advantage while they're still in law school to what yeah. to think about as soon as they come out. And so that's, mm-hmm. so yeah, we, I, it's one thing that I want to do more of next year. Yeah. And it's important. So I have, um, I've given uh, uh, a couple lectures uh, at Pepperdine University Law School in Malibu. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's the most disgustingly beautiful place I've ever been in my life. You're on the top of a cliff looking over the Pacific Ocean. I don't know how much it costs to go there, but I think it's it's worth every penny uh, and work with some of their students and also did the same uh, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And the one thing I got out of doing those lectures at the law schools, because I gave everybody my card, I said, hey, students, you know, you know, keep in touch, call me. I think every one of them got a hold of me afterwards saying like, wow, like I, I was never, I've never been exposed to this and to see what you do and how you mix with psychology and other experts was a really eye opening, um, you know, experience and um, got a, got a, got a lot of good feedback. I guess what where I am shocked, and I guess the question to you is what you just stated about what can make a huge difference with these students. Um, I don't think this is any mystery, but it sounds like maybe not a lot of law schools are, are, are doing that or maybe not doing enough of it. What is your knowledge about the types of courses that you teach? Is that sp- spreading across other law schools or is it, is it pretty isolated going from school to school? Well, so I, I'm, you know, I'm limited. I know what uh, my alma mater does, Case Western. I know that what K, uh, Cleveland State does and then Akron, which I'm at. Um, you know, so it's the only program like it in, in our region. And there's not a lot. Now, now, now law schools will have, um, they might have a psychology class, like a, like a, you know, a litigation psychology class. And that makes sense because I think of all the the non-law disciplines or fields, yeah. psychology is probably the one where you can yeah. get the most bang for your buck. If you if you you have an advantage at in how you communicate, how you negotiate, how you advocate, how you explain things to your client, if you understand psychology, so that makes sense. But um, beyond that, I haven't seen um, I, I haven't seen a lot of classes in kind of litigation, decision making, or strategy. Um, you know, strategy between uh, like achieving advantage between the main litigation events, right? That happens. Yeah. So you write, you write motions and you file them, but it's all those little decisions that you make in between those events that give you your advantages, you know, long-term advantages, not nothing like that. As far as I've seen. Um, well, it'd be nice if, um, if that, if, if that would spread right to other law schools uh, and to other, you know, areas that it may, you know, I guess every law school can make up uh, their own curriculum, but I think it would be uh, attractive for students uh, to be able to, to get some of that other non, non-legal education and training that you know is going to be relevant going forward, regardless of where you're, you're working. Now with your students, um, I'd like to get, um, put my uh, fingers on the pulse here because, um, I don't follow law schools or law students or how many people are applying, like what proportion, and maybe you talk about Akron and maybe if there's some general statistics you're aware of, I mean, how many of these folks like want to go into litigation? Uh, Is there, do you, could you, could you maybe throw out a ballpark there? Is it a little bit or is it a lot? What do you think? You know, if you look at just uh, the breakdown of, you know, there's about a million three, lawyers a year, about 40,000 new ones each year, uh, new lawyers each year. Um, I think that the number is around 20 to 25 percent um, do something with like a lit- litigation bent. Um, and uh, so, you know, about one in four go off and do sort of like traditional litigation. Yeah. And, um, so it's a fair number. Um, and yeah, and that's because um, I was curious about that kind of where the where the numbers were now, now you were, 
so so you were more of a traditional trial attorney for 20 years and then you transferred in-house yeah i was uh, i would i would you know i would say that one of the one of the things that was um that i noticed early on is that there aren't many we, we call them trial lawyers but there's very few now um you know you get because because less than two percent of cases go to trial and yep. it creates two problems one um, you know, lawyers today are learning from people who didn't try cases like back in the old days when yeah. the trial lawyers had 20 or 30 trials a year. Well, now you might have one a year if you, if you do a lot. Um, and so a lot of times lawyers are missing out on that training. And then the other piece of it, I think, which is, which is really important is that you don't get that end of case experience. You don't get the end game knowledge. And so you if you've never been in trial, you can't look back and predict what's going to be important at the beginning yeah. of the case. For instance, if you're, if you're a wallop with some issue because a jury hates your client or a witness and you don't realize it until you've actually gone through it and it was something that you could correct early on, which is something you would advocate. I've heard you advocate that on your podcast. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't know that that advantage exists until you've lived through it and probably seen it play out against you. And so, you know, those are the problems with, you know, those are the problems. I would say I was, I was a litigator, not a trial lawyer, but I knew, I at least knew that there was stuff. I had all these blind spots because of that. And I tried to fill them in, in all these different ways. Yeah, that's, and that's, 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 um, excellent background. Have you, um, do you like the transition to the in-house role as opposed from a, from a lifestyle perspective? Like, can you actually like have dinner with your family in the evening? Like, is that possible? <laughs> it's uh, and maybe it's more how I am. Um, it is, you know, in-house lawyers, there's a perception that it's easier, but I'll, I'll tell you that the, the lawyers that I practice with, uh, you know, we work our asses off. There's I'm no, sure. it's, it's no, it's no easier. It's no less of a load, stressful. Um, what I like about it, my favorite thing about it is that I get exposed to really good law firm, really good lawyers from really good law firms. And um, we can get, you know, I, I use maybe 40 law firms. And so I can wow. take, I can work with like 300 professionals who are uh, and you know, make sure that it's this wide, diverse group with all these great differences and, and backgrounds and all this stuff. And I can, I can uh, learn from all of them, yeah. you know, and, and that is my favorite piece is I get to work with really smart people, smarter than me. Uh, and I can take their ideas and pick their brain and then incorporate it into how I, you know, what kind of lawyer I am. And that's exciting. So that, that's an interesting uh, point that you, you, you work with all these um, law firms. Um, from the in-house perspective, um, because listen, law firms are always looking for new clients. And I will tell you this, because I, I work with more than 40 law firms. <laughs> I work with hundreds, if not thousands at this point. And the, the difference between the culture, the talent, the philosophy is so different. What are some of the both attorney-based and just kind of firm-based characteristics that you're looking for from the in-house perspective to say, hey, this would be a good fit for our panel and our types of cases. Yeah, so I would say um, if I were gonna, you know, I would say that we have um, kind of the, everyone has the knowledge, legal analysis, ability for advocacy and stuff, but where I think it gets really interesting is, uh, and what you, you know, um, like people who are really uh, creative, great writers is one of the most, like great communicators, right? Um, which is, again, one of those, you know, if, if you can add like a journalism training to your law, you have a huge advantage. So communication, yeah. creativity, the ability to uh, make predictions uh, about and, and you know, um, and, and use numbers and be comfortable with numbers yeah. and making predictions about outcomes. That's great. And then the psychology piece is huge. Anyone that, you know, anyone that's paying attention to um, you know, the biases and uh, the, the kind of the cognitive traps that, that lawyers, we fall into all the time from the moment we get the complaint. Anyone who's paying attention to that, and, and they don't have to be expert in it. There are experts to do that. But anyone that's paying attention to those kinds of things, it gets me excited. That's, that, that, that's excellent. Now, 
I'm not sure if you're aware of this being in-house, but well, there's, there's two, I think there's two really, really bad problems going on, particularly with the defense bar um, is number one. You, well, you already mentioned number one, there's not a lot of trial attorneys out there and, and, and that's, that's a, a problem and that's going to rear its ugly head as we go year by year and folks start, you know, retiring the people behind them, I think may have their hands full because I do think that their counterparts on the plaintiff side um, try many more cases are far more trained because they're in a very different uh, system. But, but another problem I've seen, which is a national problem. And I hear about it every week from big time partners at law firms that are so annoyed saying these millennial attorneys bounce around from firm to firm. They don't want to work past five o'clock. They don't want to be in the office before 901 and they don't want to work on weekends. And then when you pressure them, they quit <laughs> and they, they go someplace else. And so I find the partners at a lot of these law firms I work with a lot of turnover on the, on the associate end, and they're struggling to get those draft picks right up to the starting positions. Do you talk about that in your classes or is there actually, maybe you talk about that uh, amongst your colleagues, because I think that's a big, big problem. The lack of consistency at that level and you don't have those people growing within the firm. Yeah, I think that it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great question. It's a great issue. And, and I think that I've heard the same thing. We can't keep talent. It's the millennials. Yeah. I, the millennial bashing and stuff. Um, I, I would <laughs> I love say bashing that millennials. <laughs> I, would, I would say that, um, you know, that if we, I'll put it this way. If we went to those same partners that are complaining about not being able to keep their millennials and we said, uh, Eaton will pay your hourly rate to go fix the problem and figure out ways to keep them there, yeah. they wouldn't shrug their shoulders and give up after six minutes, charge us point yeah. one. They would figure it out. So I would say for them to figure it out. For, for us, for Eaton, we get really excited. And, and actually one of my, uh, our head of litigation, we, uh, we call it jetpack jetpacks we we when we get a young lawyer we try to get them in a, a, you know as engaged as we can in our matters give them Good. leadership roles give them training give them mentoring if they want it um to try and develop them and we call it jetpack like we we shoot them off into the stratosphere and we get them ahead of everybody else and that's what we try and do um, that's our way of trying to um help firms um you know help firms keep their young talented people interested and that's and terrific. Hopefully interested in in our work because it is a problem um and you know we do talk about it for sure yeah because i i get a lot of um again i, I hear a lot of head you know being a psychologist people just kind of dump their <laughs> goddamn problems on you and so a lot of it is you know i got this superstar i want you know him or her or whoever to to get more experience the, ins the insurance company won't let me or they, they, they won't let them do the opening. They won't let me do it. They only want me. And from a, a, from an insurance defense standpoint, I think this is another dumb thing going on because with the claims people and I've talked to the claims people too, like, hey, I'm not having some rookie come out of the bullpen to throw in a World Series game. No, 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 no. I'm going with the starter and, you know, the that the, the, the associate can be the bat boy or whatever. It, there's got to be some give and take here. I mean, otherwise, th these young, talented attorneys are just going to be writing briefs and motions, and they're not going to be able to get in front of those juries uh, or do those, even do the mock trials. Um, and I guess the problem I have with that is uh, all the conferences I go to, this is not an issue that actually comes up too much in the in the, in the domain of the presentations or the discuss, it's like the dirty little secret. No one wants to talk about. I mean, how can we get the word out there to try to, you know, convince, you know, between corporate America and the insurance industry that we've, we've got to have a way to get these folks up to speed because otherwise when these very experienced trial attorneys say, you know what, I'm going to my lake house, I'm done. 
and then the person behind them has tried six cases to verdict, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, and it's going to be a problem for their for their clients. It's a great, yeah. you know, it's a great observation. I think, um, you know, for the matters that uh, I can say, you know, it, it, for the matters that Eaton gives out to firms and has people, we, we insist that um, that the younger lawyers are involved in a meaningful way, and we we invite them to all the conferences. We ask them questions. We get them speaking, and then we tell the you know, the relationship partner or whoever it is, um, we say this, that for our, um, you know, sort of for our model to work, it's, it's best ideas win. And if you're not getting ideas from your whole team, then we're not going to get the best ideas. We're going to get your ideas. And frankly, we don't want just your ideas. We want your whole teams. And so if the first year associate or a paralegal isn't comfortable participating or isn't giving them a, given a meaningful role, well, then you're doing us a disservice. And we try and communicate that and, and uh, Stan Ball, the, our head of litigation is he, you know, when, when we have calls with our firms, he'll go down the list and make sure that he's getting the, I, the ideas and opinions of everybody on that call from most senior to least senior. Uh, and I think it's a good way to handle it. Outstanding. Let's, um, let's wrap up on, uh, you, write, you write a blog. I do. And tell I don't know us if anyone uh, reads it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you may be surprised. Uh, they may be reading after this. Um, tell us um, um, about the blog and and what and, and what types of things you're 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 you're, you're posting. Yeah, the, you, so it's it was it started as sort of a companion to my class. It's called WinningBeforeTrial.com, and and nice. but I post articles. Uh, it, it's Winning Before Trial. It's like separating you from the robot lawyers. And what I'm trying to do is just what I want people to do is, you know, if you think about the practice of law, you know, we've, we're, we're a profession that honors precedent. We adhere to what has happened in the past. And if we started today uh, from scratch and we have all these competitors, these clogged dockets, these overworked judges, we have all this science that, you know, what you do that's more available to us, um, if we started today, we would do it differently than we did 50 years ago. And so, yeah, you know, but, but we do it the same. And so the challenge there is I try and write articles that get people, hopefully somebody just thinks and says, yeah, I never, I never thought about doing it a different way. Uh, I'm not saying I'm right about everything. I'm just saying that there are things that we do that don't make sense. And one of them is not understanding, uh, not bringing in people like you or, or CSI to explain the basic psychology of, yeah. of communication and what your jurors are thinking. It's, it's science that's there. So it's stuff like that. That's, that's terrific. So it's uh, winning before trial.com. Uh, we'll, we'll post that um, below uh, this episode uh, when we post the episode and I'll be, that'll be on my favorites bar uh, to make sure <laughs> I'm uh, up there. And if, if you need any, if you want, if you want to quote me on something, feel free to. Um, this has been a great episode, Charlie. Thank you so much for coming hey, on. Can Last... I ask you one question? Yes, please. I'd like to end on a question for you. Oh, sure. So from where you sit, you work with all these, all these different law firms and all these different companies. And if you are, a, you know, if you're a, a company that has, you know, litigation, you know, coming in over and over and, you know, what would be your advice about how an in-house law department or how our firms can get better like tomorrow and start, what should we be thinking about as a company? Being aggressive early in cases, the number one thing you can do, because that's what your adversary is doing, right? If you're on the defense side. And so the, the, the top thing that we preach, in fact, we, we have a new, a new set of services that I'm, I'm speaking around the country on and we're already implementing that we call pre-litigation services pre-litigation because we had companies and firms calling us saying listen why are we waiting till a case is filed to be prepared for litigation why can't we start we know who the key witnesses are going to be in most of these cases we know who our corporate reps are right we should have a system ready to go so when the case is filed you know we're starting at the the 50 yard line we're not starting at our own 20 and so that's what's really we've been doing here the last couple of years and boy, it's exploding. It's exploding almost too fast because my phone keeps ringing because everybody wants to get on board with this because they have figured out, you know, investing time, energy and money 
in prevention has a huge cost savings on the back end, number one, but also gives you a nice strategic advantage because what you don't want to do as a defendant, I'll tell you this, and this has happened. I won't name the companies, but I know who they are. They're viewed by the plaintiff's bar as an ATM machine, right? Hey, I need some money. I know exactly who to go to because they're going to pay me. They, they're not prepared. They're not going to go to trial and they go in, they put in their password and they get their money. And I think if you have that reputation as a company or an insurance company or defendant, you know, they're going to keep doing that and taking advantage of it. So I think what we're trying to pioneer here is a movement of very, very early proactive preparation, which, yeah, is going to take time, money and energy that's going to have an extraordinary impact on the back end because the adversary is banking on i mean betting the farm that the defendant won't be ready that they won't will not have been proactive and that they will they will have the lead uh for the entire game and that's gonna that's gonna turn out to financially really pay off for them and probably less trial experience too so we're when when you yeah. when yeah. our firms wait into trial they may have tried 10 percent of the cases that the plaintiff's bar has tried you know yeah. And then the plaintiff's you know, the plaintiff's bar is like, why in the world would I settle this case for a reasonable amount when I know I've got you? I've got you. <laughs> Eight yeah. out of ten times in front of a jury, I've got you. Why in the world? I mean, those hey, you roll the dice on that, right? And so that's that's kind of what we're preaching on this end. And I think it's a so far so good. Um, I'll be speaking uh with John Nunnally at uh IADC, and you'll be there and we'll we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about and go over the causes of nuclear verdicts uh, and things like that. But I, I have the final question because I'm the host. So you can't get okay. the final. I have got a final question. All, All right. right. Halloween day, one o'clock, Pittsburgh at Cleveland. Cleveland laying three and a half points. I want your score. Cleveland, the Browns are going to take it. We're going to take it 33 24. 33 to 24. I like that. And that's easily covering the spread. 33, 24. I'm all over that. Go Browns. <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> thank Browns. you so much for being uh, on the podcast today. I'm sure we'll be in touch regularly. Contact me if you need anything. Yeah, you do the same. It was an honor. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Take care. And for everybody that's listening and watching, thank you for participating in another episode of the Litigation Psychology Podcast. Brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. See you next time.